All right, welcome to Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin, and this is Lecture 13. Those of you playing along at home won't know that uh, we have five pizzas here today, and consider this my apology for having fallen behind on your Project 3. So I thought we'd outdo brownies with pizza, at least for the two of you that are here tonight. So um, tonight is sort of a hodgepodge of everything. That's not to say that we're going to spend much time at all on any of these XML-related languages, but rather um, touch upon them. So at least you've seen them, so that at least you have perhaps some answers to any outstanding questions. But what I thought we'd do first tonight is come back to spend a bit more time on what David Lieberman spent last week. Um, I actually put together a couple of demos of my own so that in addition to David's lecture last week, which gave you some of the high-level concepts and some of the terminology and some of the technologies verbally, uh, tonight, I thought we'd begin by diving a little bit deeper so that hopefully by the end of tonight, you can exit here and know how you would go about implementing something in Ajax, if simple, but something nonetheless. So he talked about a few neat things. So the, the gist of the lecture was about Ajax, but he also touched upon some interesting APIs, JDOM and JXPath, which I thought we'd begin with because it's certainly uh, of potential use to you now, especially that you've seen the alternatives, namely JAXP and DOM proper and so forth. So, anyone recall what JDOM was when David mentioned it last week? Yeah, uh, in, yeah. so what is JDOM? It's an alternative to JAXP, so specifically the Java aspect of JAXP that relates to DOM. So, we in this course really haven't spent much time at all on the official DOM API within JAXP. We did a little bit early on, but for the most part, it's a fairly cumbersome API. DOM itself is written in a language neutral form, and if you pull up the specification for it for level 1, 2, or 3, version 1, 2, or 3, you'll see that it's written essentially in an intermediate definition language, an IDL, which means it abstracts away completely from the specific language in which the processor might be implemented in, but the API that it specs out is rather cumbersome. I mean, recall such functions as get first child or get children. There was a lot of iteration. There was a lot of manual traversing of the trees and so forth, and DOM itself is certainly not fundamentally related to Java. So a couple of guys sort of in response to what they perceived as shortcomings or nuisances of the JAXP DOM API decided that they would write something that is not language independent but very much tied to Java and to its syntax and to its features but that implements the spirit of DOM and it'll essentially it'll let you achieve DOM like things in much fewer in many fewer lines of code in in perhaps a more intuitive API. So if you're interested in checking this out and downloading the jars and such and playing around with it, um, you can surf on over to jdom.org. What I went ahead and did myself, just to give you a bit more sense of what David was talking about, though, is give you at least one example here on the board. So this is taken from um, a talk that one of the authors of JDOM gave. So if you want to look at more of his presentation about what JDOM is, the URL is at the bottom of your slide there. And one of the examples he began his talk with was to just contrast. DOM with JDOM. And this sort of captures the spirit of what the purpose of JDOM is. You can't fundamentally do anything that you couldn't with another API like DOM, but you can just do it more easily, more simply. So in JDOM, if you wanted to go ahead and add a new text element called uh, whose value is this is the root, in JDOM you would do it, say, with these four lines of code. And the equivalent, uh, in effect, of that same code in DOM is just more lines of code, longer lines of code, a bit more cumbersome. And this doesn't necessarily capture all that you can do with JDOM, but at least hints at the spirit of it. And I've not met yet, I've not met anyone yet who's used JDOM and who hasn't liked it or hasn't preferred it to the alternative. So next time you're coding up something after this course that relies, requires some kind of DOM manipulation or maintenance of your entire XML input in memory, consider using something like JDOM rather than taking our first pass approach from like lectures one through three where we went with the standard JAXP APIs. And it's fairly simple to pick up. They got usage and FAQs on the website. Do take a look. What's JXPath? So JXPath is simply an API from Apache that implements um, XPath or XPath-like queries, not only for XML documents, but also, curiously enough, for Java structures. So you can sort of, this is taken from the, I think the FAQ or the tutorial or whatnot from JXPath's own website, whose URL is down there. And what the, ex the first example they give in their own documentation is this. So in plain old Java, if you have a, uh, let's see, a vendor object, 
and a vendor has some number of locations, assuming you're using standardized container classes, you, if you want to get all of those locations, you might simply call something like get locations and, inst and store them uh, or access them via reference to a collection object. You might then grab an iterator, and then you might iterate over that collection. And each time you iterate over an element in the collection, you might check does the current location zip code equal 90210? And if so, go ahead and grab that particular address. Well, there's clearly just implicit in that example some kind of hierarchy. You have a collection of vendors, each of which has its own locations, each of which has its own zip codes and corresponding address. So just imagine in your mind what that structure might look like if you sketched it out on paper. Well, JXPath, in addition to allowing you to navigate XML proper, also allows you, interestingly enough, to navigate Java structures, so long as they implement standard APIs like that. So what the JXPath folks offer is this example, which is the equivalent JXPath to this plain old Java code. Specifically, if you want to get that same address, you might do some magic there with JXPath context.newContext of vendor, passing it the uh, sort of parent object, and then just say get value of what? and literally traverse the Java object structure in memory as though it were a familiar XML-like hierarchical structure. So that, too, is pretty nifty. If only, if you only, if, if certainly you use it for XML structures, but if you're curious, at, uh, curious to play around with some other sort of approaches to Java code just by installing a library in your class path, do take a look at JXPath as well. Yeah. Does it work with trees? It should work with trees. I suspect it might run into trouble, or there might be some gotchas when it comes to circular structures, if you've got loops back in your tree, or if you have a, a graph proper. But it should as well. It, there are certain, I believe, uh, certain APIs that it has to support. So for instance, a collection, if you want to actually access the whole structure, and then um, it might be dependent on how exactly you've stored the objects in the container class there. But I would, I would have to defer to the documentation. Other questions? So pretty neat. And actually, I think the spirit of XPath is a pretty neat and then pretty intuitive approach to grabbing data in general. So it's a nice outgrowth of XML itself. And so now we're here at Ajax. So Ajax is perhaps one of the sexiest things out there these days. And it's not so much hype, I think. It's actually compelling. Um, recently, there was released, I think, or announced by Sun, uh, Java FX, which is purported to be similar in spirit to Ajax, but Ajax, at the end of the day, is largely about, uh, is largely about making neater, more interactive, more seamless user interfaces. It doesn't really equip you to do anything we couldn't do for the past several years with existing web technologies, but it just allows us, in my opinion, to do them better. And I always refer to, say, Google Maps, which I've alluded to in the past, just to make clear, perhaps, wherein lies the Ajax in Google Maps. I'll go ahead and pull up with a browser, maps.google.com. So if we pull up, for instance, uh, the address of the Science Center, 1 Oxford, Oxford Street, Cambridge, Mass, 02138. So notice the page itself has not reloaded. So there it might have when I click there. But now, you're, most of everyone in the room has probably used Google Maps by now and pushed, uh, clicked and dragged the map around. Well, notice certainly first, when you click and drag, it's only this little box that's changing. But notice if I do it quickly enough, what do you see flashes of? Sorry? Yeah, so there's some kind of transferring going on, right? You see that there's these gray splotches that show up ever so briefly. If I were on a dial-up modem, they would linger around longer. What that means is that the GIFs corresponding or the pings corresponding to those quadrants simply haven't been downloaded from the server yet. So the AJAX that's going on here effectively, unless Google has now implemented its own sort of API, but they probably use a similar uh, common base foundation for it, is every time you click and drag, the JavaScript code that happens to be integrated into the site has figured out where, in which direction you've dragged, and thus inferring which new squares you need. It then makes an HTTP request of one of Google's servers and says, give me the GIF corresponding to coordinates x, comma, y. They download in the background, they're returned by and received by their code via an event handler, and then they simply insert it into the div structure or the table or whatever it is they're using underneath the hood. So Ajax, in this case, is being used for a very much graphical environment. If you go to, by contrast, let's see if I can recall the URL. 
So good question. How does this differ from refreshing the whole map? The whole page, rather. Someone else want to respond to that? Yeah? So the edges of the map are being downloaded all of the time. None of this is ever being reloaded, which has a number of implications, all, most of which boil down to user interface. So suppose that, and the Google Maps isn't necessarily the best example because they don't really do scrolling. They just shrink the whole page altogether. But for one example, imagine a page that you might have had a scroll bar and you scroll halfway down the page. Well, unless you do some clever JavaScript tricks, if every time you click and drag in a different direction the whole page changes, you lose the positioning, for instance, of your page. That in and of itself may be not a fundamentally huge problem, but it's sort of representative of the spirit of uh, state that is thrown away when you change pages altogether. If I had started to type things out, that data too would be, um, would, too would disappear. And ultimately, I think the biggest compelling feature is that you just don't have that half a second or 200 millisecond flicker in a page. It's much more like a standard GUI application than it is like typical click and um, click based browsing. Correct. So every time I click and drag, additional GIFs, let's say, are being downloaded, and they are being placed according to an XY coordinates in this square. And also, the asynchronous way, so those things can be cached. You don't have, not every single drop has a server call. Right. Depends on the location, depends on where you are, where you click. True. And this convention of asynchronicity is, is nice, too. And you notice this if you have one of these smartphones now that has things like Google Maps and so forth. When you have such latency and relatively slower connections, you really see the hourglasses spinning. But the upside is that even if I click and drag and I'm sort of waiting for the rest of the imagery to download, the rest of the page is still, in spirit, useful. So that too. But again, I would say this is a marginal improvement upon user interfaces, but it's fundamentally changing, I think, the interfaces you see on the web. And I don't quite remember the URL that I want to pull up here. Um, Live.com. Live search, is it? Um, sorry? Live search dot what? Maps. It, uh, it's not maps that I want this time, though. Um, live dot com. It's not this. Live dot com. Live search. Hey, Jack. If I can't find it. Oh, no, it's not there. OK, I will try to come up with this. Essentially, what I was going to show you was an example of a, actually, maybe it's not that. Let me try one more thing. There we go. OK, so this is a website that was created um, by Yahoo, or it's based on Yahoo. Um, Currently, terribly simple. But this is sort of a prototype, really, of how you might change problems like search. So give me something to search for. Ajax. OK, so I'm interested in Ajax. In a traditional search engine, like Google or any other, you would type your command. You would hit submit. The whole page would refresh. You'd look at your 10 listings. You would then say more. The whole page would refresh. And it's much more of a, a clunky interface. Useful and perhaps efficient, but clunky. If now I type Ajax, notice immediately I get some hints or some keyword matches that I might want to dive in deeper on, and I immediately get a change in page here. But if I instead want to be more precise here, I want Ajax as it relates to, say, JavaScript. Notice things start dynamically updating themselves. And again, this is a marginal improvement, I would argue, but it's perhaps a compelling one, especially if developers now and, and management teams and product managers are really trying to make the experience much more about the user than about the particular implementation details. So this is an example, if you want to pull this up at, up at home, livesearch.alltheweb.com. And they've pretty much, I think, stolen Google's layout here anyway. But you see the dynamism involved. So how does this all work? So David last week mentioned this object called HTML, uh, or rather XML HTTP request. This essentially is a, an object that is now supported in JavaScript for all of the major browsers. So if you can trust in your business or commercial enterprise that your users are going to have at least IE6 and maybe Firefox 1.5 or 2.0 or a recent version of Safari or of uh, Opera, you can pretty much rely on these kinds of um, interfaces working. 
these days. If someone's still running Netscape 4, maybe not, but that's perhaps an unreasonable expectation now anyways. So this is taken, this is a quote taken from a W3C working draft that seems terribly recent, but Ajax has been possible for some time. The W3C has simply tried to get involved and standardize the actual API, but it's still in working draft form. It doesn't mean that the popular browsers, though, haven't themselves implemented this functionality. Uh, so, what is this object? So if you're familiar, you're familiar with Java as an object-oriented programming language, AJAX stands for what? Just to contextualize this. Or used to stand for what? Yeah, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And as David said, you don't necessarily have to use it with XML anymore. There are different tricks. You can use it with something called JSON, J-S-O-N, which is JavaScript, which is sort of a clever and more efficient way sometimes of delivering data. But the spirit of it is still the same. But it is very much grounded in JavaScript. And if you haven't had any JavaScript programming experience, frankly, who cares? If you know Java, you can certainly pick up JavaScript, which is a much uglier and uh, clunkier language, which I would say, but almost identical in syntax and in, I wouldn't say features, but certainly in syntax. And certainly in the base uh, features, it has the same. So if this is an object, it's got a bunch of methods and properties associated with it. What are the methods? It's pretty straightforward. You got an abort method, get all response headers, get response header, open, send, set request header. The two most interesting ones and the ones we'll look at tonight are these two. This allows me to open a connection to a server from the browser. This allows me to send a request to the server. Well, what properties, what member, data members does this object have? Well, it's got these. On ready state change, which is a pointer to an event handler. In other words, when you instantiate this XML HTTP request object, and for instance, you call open to open a connection with it to some destination website, and then you call send, Presumably, a send is going to be responded to with a receive of some sort. So the way that this object works is that you register via this property an event handler that gets invoked when this object has some additional information for you. So asynchronous JavaScript and XML, the first keyword sort of says it all. It's all about asynchronicity. You can do it synchronously, but what I mean by asynchronous is that you make a request of a server, and you'll be notified when the server is ready to get back to you. Until then, you can just spin a little hourglass for the user or put a little please wait downloading data, any sort of informative message just saying to the user, I'm waiting myself for the response. And what will happen, assuming you've registered an event handler, is as soon as the server has gotten back to the browser, the browser will say, hey, I'm going to invoke your method so you can do what you will now with my response. Ready state signifies exactly what the... Um, it's a property that tells you, are you in a good state, in a bad state, essentially? Did the connection succeed or fail? And these are the juicy ones, response text and response XML. So sort of fundamental to this object, as its name implies, is some form of XML. So assuming the server returns an XML document, you can access that document as effectively a DOM by way of this data member, and I'll show you how to do that. Response text is almost identical, except you don't get a reference to a DOM, but rather you just get a big string that is the XML itself. And if you want to just display it, great. If you want to parse it yourself, fine. But otherwise, it depends on your goal as to which one you might use. Status gives you specifically the HTTP response code, so whether it's 200 or 404 or whatnot, and then status text is like the corresponding um, message to the status. Okay, so let's go ahead and do an example. So one that I whipped up is as follows. In your second printout tonight, you see two files, one called ajax.html and one called ajax.jsp. This is by design a very simple example, but one that should give you a framework that you can copy paste and start doing more interesting things yourself. And I can't emphasize enough how useful um, and relatively how straightforward a lot of the tutorials are out there. Google Ajax tutorial and the top few hits will be some useful references in themselves. Um, so with that said, what have I given you here? So in tonight's examples directory, there's a server subdirectory that pretty much I copied from a lecture 11. So if you remember our examples with Tomcat from a couple weeks ago with the tax service and with the other stuff, I pretty much copied that directory and put in only two files this time. I ripped out the warehouse, I ripped out the taxes, and in this web apps directory, there's one root directory and then these two files. In other words, since I wanted to use JSP just to be consistent with what we've been doing in the class, I'm gonna run my own instance of Tomcat to play around with Ajax. By no means a requirement. The server side code you write can be written, in this case in JSP, 
can be written in Perl, can be written in ASP, can be written in PHP, can be written in anything you want. So long as you support HTTP responses, you can use any language you wish. So what are these files? Well, let's take a look at ajax.html. If you've never seen JavaScript before, what you'll see tonight is very similar to Java. It's certainly not anything hard to pick up. So this is a web page, enzin.html. For convenience, I've embedded my JavaScript in this file so we can sort of contain ourselves to one file. We got some XHTML stuff up there, and now in the head of my web page, I have not just a title tag eventually, with which you're familiar, but also a script tag. And just so I have a sense of the audience, how many of you have programmed in JavaScript before? Okay, so about half, sort of. Okay, so there's not much code here, as we'll see. Most of it's white space. So what does this file do? Well, let's ignore the JavaScript for a moment and look at just the web page part. The web page is just this. So knowing what you do about XHTML, what's this web page going to look like? Just a button and and there, sorry, yeah. There's an empty dropdown, so it's got an empty dropdown menu and a button. It's perhaps the stupidest web page I could come up with, but it's sort of the bare bones framework with which we can play with this stuff. So what I'm going to do in another window is open up another connection just so that I can run the server and also look at the code at the same time. So I'm going to go into my examples 13 directory, server directory and just run Tomcat in advance. Actually, did I in advance? Yep, I think I hard-coded in port 8080 for this example. Yep, and I'm on ICE4, and what I'm going to do is make one change up here, just so I don't forget. And again, for simplicity, I hard-coded this stuff in there. You wouldn't necessarily do this, but for demo, it's fine. So what does this web page look like? I'm going to pull up my browser, go to HTTP, ice4.fas.harvard.edu, 8080. There's our familiar Tomcat interface. There's a swap file because I'm editing the file with VI right now. And here's that terribly ugly web page. So it's got a button and it's got a dropdown. And in that dropdown currently is nothing. All right, so the goal of this exercise, simple as it is, is simply to populate that select menu dynamically without refreshing the whole page. I don't want to see a flicker. I simply want to be able to click that button and immediately this dropdown is going to get filled with a whole bunch of randomly generated numbers that are coming from the server. Now, obvious objection, I could do this in JavaScript, but that's not the point of the exercise. So let's tie it together. So in the HTML, here again is the form. And I'm using a form not in the traditional sense, but just to create the interface of a form. So I don't even care about an action or a method attribute in this case. All I care about is the button here. Now, what is this perhaps signifying? Yeah, so on click of this button, call the function go. So if you've not used much JavaScript before, a lot of it can be accessed by way of these event Handlers. So there's a lot of built-in, predefined event handlers that, can, that are accessed by way of attributes of elements. So you can simply say, on click, call this function. There's on mouse over, on mouse up, on key press down, on key press up, all of the sort of basics. And this is how Gmail, for instance, if you've ever used its neat features, allows you to use keyboard shortcuts to interact with a web page. And that's fairly unusual in today's web pages, even though it's possible. But it's using JavaScript event handlers. So what's this function go? Well, up here, I have my head tag and then my script tag. Trivia question, why have I encapsulated all of this JavaScript in a C data section? Yeah, so if I care about having valid XHTML for whatever reasons, well, by sandwiching all of this stuff in a C data section, I ensure that it's not going to get parsed by the browser. It's just going to get ignored, which is good, because now I don't have to worry about special characters. I can use, op uh, I can use open bracket and close bracket without regard or concern for escaping them as ampersand LT or GT and all that craziness. So I can just write my JavaScript code. Okay, so what's going on? Go takes no arguments. It, uh, JavaScript supports try catch for, um, for error checking and such. I have a variable called request. There's really no notion of data typing in JavaScript, really. It's not strongly typed. And I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to assign request the re reference to or a pointer to an XML HTTP request object. So this is clearly a constructor. Um, the comment there is just telling you that this is the name of the object that Firefox, Opera, and Safari 
the newest versions support. Problem is that, and this is a pain in the neck, if nothing else, the browsers to this day, 10 years after, 15 years after the web started catching on, still we lack standards in this stuff. Internet Explorer uses an ActiveX object to achieve the same functionality and to implement effectively the same API. Unfortunately, you can do this in a number of ways. There's a lot of ways to detect what browser you're running, but one way you can do it is just to try to instantiate one object, and if it fails, try to instantiate the other. This is probably isn't the best approach because you're sort of using uh, um, try-catch blocks for logic control, but at least it's sort of simple and straightforward. And when you instantiate objects, you probably want to try and catch exceptions anyway, so at least we're killing two birds with one stone here. So if that fails, well, if I don't care what the exception was. I'm going to assume that just means it's the wrong browser. I'm going to instead try to instantiate an ActiveX object of this type for IE's sake, but I'm going to assign it to the same uh, reference so that I can just refer to it as the same. And then, if that fails, I'm just going to return. I'm just going to infer that Ajax just doesn't work in this website or in this browser. So, what do I then do? Three things, and here are two of those API calls. I call request.open using a method of get. The alternative, would, I hear it too. The alternative would be post, but I'm just going to use get for simplicity, and I'm going to connect effectively to this URL. So I'm making an HTTP request of that URL. I'm guessing it's the lights, maybe? Um, all right, so next, I'm going to register that event handler. So request.onReadyStateChange, right, there's our verbosity again. OnReadyStateChange is going to get assigned an anonymous function. And this is a common JavaScript trick. It's like writing a Lambda function whereby you can define a nameless function that nonetheless gets invoked by pointer or by reference. So it's just anonymous so using this keyword. You could do this in different ways. I wanted to do it in a one-liner way. But any time the state of this object changes, I want this function to be invoked. What's that function going to do? It's going to call the handler function, passing to it the request object itself. And again, there are different ways to do this. So you'll see different approaches and different tutorials. And then I'm going to send my request. I'm not sending any post data, so I'm just passing in null. But what this is going to do is send a request via get to this string. So this is equivalent to just pulling up in a web browser this URL. OK? All right, so what happens next then? Do you mind checking maybe with the AV folks if they can at least shut the lights off? I don't think we. Oh, let me see, actually. Oh, never mind, Chris. Sorry, those of you playing along at home, there's a high pitched buzzing in the room right now. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, I think that's better. Okay, so question for you what happens next? Because that seems to be the end of the function. It waits. It waits. OK, presumably the web server, assuming it's up and running, is going to return a response. Let's see what that response is before seeing what's done with it. I'm going to go ahead and copy this URL and just paste it into a normal web browser. So I'm going to open up a new tab here and go to that URL. And it appears to just return an XML document. I'm going to refresh it, another XML document, but with another 10 random numbers. So all I have apparently in this ajax.jsp as you might see in your printouts, is a few lines of JSP code that just generate 10 random numbers. And I arbitrarily decided to return these numbers in the form of an XML document whose root element is numbers and whose children are called number, whose text nodes are simply the numbers I want to return. By no means the most efficient representation, but it allows us to sort of play around with an XML return. And this is pretty printed in Firefox, but if we actually look at the source, it's just an XML document. That's all. So what's this JSP look like? Well, ajax.jsp simply looks like this. And ignore the top few lines for a moment, because they just fixed some bugs thanks to uh, Microsoft. What am I doing? The real code is here. So first, the very top line, if you've ever wondered with JSP how to return an XML document, by default, it returns a content type text HTML. If you don't want that, you have to override it and say, give me text HTML. Otherwise, browsers will tend to choke on the response even if it happens to be XML. So bear that in mind as a, as a future bug check. Then I'm going to instantiate a pseudo random number generator here using Java's random library. I'm going to seed it with the current time just so I get some better randomness here. 
And now I'm going to return a raw open bracket numbers close bracket. Notice it's outside of my little scriptlet tags. And then I'm going to do these sort of, dare say, clever or commonly done one-liners where if I want to output some raw data with a bit of dynamic data in between, if you've not seen this trick before in PHP or JSP, I can do something like this thanks to squiggly braces in this case. For int i gets 0, I'm going to give 10 of these things back, plus plus, open bracket, but no now to notice close scriptlet. Whatever now is raw here is just going to be outputted again and again and again on each iteration. What's going to be outputted? Well, what's going to be outputted is the result of printing the pseudo random number generators next int. And I arbitrarily said, give me an int from uh, 0 to 99, I think this implies. And then I close the number tag, I close my scriptlet, I close my Java code here, and I close my root element. So the effect you've already seen is to return 10 of these things. All right, what's all this stuff about? So in short, you would think this is a bit of overkill, but this is five different ways to tell the browser not to cache the returned file. Thank Microsoft for the need for one or more of these lines. But essentially, with the XML HTTP request object, if I were to, in this interface I've whipped up, click that button again and again and again, I would get the same 10 numbers again and again and again. Because IE just takes it upon itself, despite the fact AJAX is all about this dynamic retrieval of data, to retrieve the cached version, unless you explicitly tell it via all possible headers to handle all possible versions of browsers that you don't want the browser to cache the file. And you'll Google and Usenet are riddled with suggestions for things like this. And you'll bang your head against the wall wondering why it's working in Firefox and not in IE. Think uh, at, after this class to check your HTTP headers. OK? For now, you can copy and paste to your heart's content. So this is the XML that's returned. This is the interface. So hopefully, when I click this button, I promise that the menu would get populated with 10 numbers. So there's 10 numbers. Let's do it again. There's 10 more numbers, right? Kind of cool the first time. Gets uninteresting pretty quickly. But how is this menu now getting populated? And this now is a bit more about JavaScript and XML than it is about say, any of the Java stuff we just did, because we're going to change back to our ajax.html, because tell me this, when that response comes back, when this XML document is returned, what happens in the context of my browser? Mm -hmm. My event handler is executed. The guy I registered with the object in the first place is finally invoked, and that invocation is going to be effectively inform me, the developer who wrote the code, was it a success? Did the connection time out? Was it the file not found? All of those kinds of things. So essentially, you're writing sort of the innards of what we know as browser functionality here. So here's my handler function. I just called it that. You can call it anything you want. And again, you can implement the same code in many different ways. But I passed in that same request object so I'd have access to those properties so I can do some introspection and check what the values are. So I'm going to check if the requests ready state equals equals 4. And you can look this up. There's, I think, five total states, 0 through 4, where 4 signifies everything went well. That's a good thing. And the request status, the HTTP status specifically, is 200, which similarly means from HTTP that everything went well. It wasn't a 404 or 501 or one of those things. I'm going to go ahead and do something with the return data. Well, what am I going to do? Well, here now is where we can tie in our discussion and our lessons way back when on DOM. So AJAX and JavaScript specifically very much uses the API or the spirit of DOM to actually navigate the XML that's returned. David mentioned that you can simply return XHTML or HTML fragments. You can just return text, and you can just insert those into your web page. And that's absolutely true. And sometimes that is the best way to do things. You can simply paste things into what's called an inner HTML um, yeah, an inner HTML property. And we can whip up a quick demo of that in a moment. But I thought it would be more illustrative to actually use XML here, just so you get a taste for it. So what am I going to do? A variable called doc is going to be assigned the request objects, response HTML objects, document element. So think of this as the document, the XML itself, 
and document element, foolishly named, is the... Uh, well, actually, is that, a, is that true, actually? No, that's not true. That is well named in this case. I'm thinking of the other thing. Um, the document element is the doc node at the top. And that's useful because it, it comes with special methods like get elements by tag name, get element by ID, though I'm using that in a different context. The alternative, and you can do it this way, you can do the whole children thing. You can get all the children, iterate over the children. That's a pain if nothing else. If you know the structure of your XML and you know that doing an exhaustive search isn't going to be terribly expensive, you can just get all of the elements by their tag name without great impact on performance. So what I'm doing here is declaring an array implicitly that's going to be assigned all of the number elements in the returned fragment. Then I'm going to do this. And this now is referring to my local code, not to the returned code. So options is going to be a, an array that corresponds to the document, not doc. Document is now the web page in question. This is client side now. The current web page is menu element, or rather element with an ID of menu, and its options. Now what is this? And this is where if you don't know much JavaScript or haven't done this kind of coding before, you've got to skim a couple of tutorials or skim a book to figure out this stuff. But essentially, perhaps unbeknownst to you, there are a whole bunch of properties associated with elements in HTML and XHTML that you can access by way of JavaScript. For instance, if we want to get the element, whatever it is, in the HTML document that uh, has an ID of menu, you simply do this, get element by ID, quote unquote, menu. Turns out that a select menu has a couple properties, one of which is an array called options. And that array is called options. So just for syntactic simplicity, I'm just assigning it a shortcut name of just options. So I don't have to do all that dot notation again and again. So now I've got a pointer essentially to the array of options in the select menu, which initially has how many options? None, so it's null essentially. I also have an array of the number elements in the returned XML document. And the goal then is to get the, form, the latter into the former the XML elements into the select menu. So how do we do this? Turns out one line of code, mm, plus these things. So for, I'm just going to iterate over the numbers arrays length. And this is how you do length in um, JavaScript. It's not a method, it's a property. I am going to now do the following. The options arrays, zeroth element, because by default it was zero, of length zero you said, it was empty. So options.length is initially zero. I'm going to put in the zeroth location of that array a new option object. So I'm calling a constructor in JavaScript for a new option object. And that happens to take four arguments, most of which are not interesting tonight. But the first one is because it's actually the value that's going to show up in the menu. And the rest I'll defer to another discussion. But a new option of numbers. And now this is the array of what? XML elements. So the zeroth number element, so the first ones, first child, node value. So think of this exactly like DOM. If this gives me a number element, this gives me its first and only text node, and this gives me that node's value. And that should be a structure you recall from our DOM discussions. So what that puts in the zeroth location is exactly that text value, the, random, the first randomly generated number. The neat trick about JavaScript is that arrays are more like vectors than they are like arrays and that they dynamically resize. So the reason I can get away with this rather than using i here, I could have used i, but I can just use this here because every time you add something to an array, its length property grows by one, by one, by one. So this is a clever one-liner trick just to know. So what's the net result, just to remind? This is the XML that's coming back. This is how the menu's changing. So this in and of itself, not terribly useful probably, but hopefully what it'll give you if you'd like to play around with this after this class is sort of the basic framework with which you can start to write client-side code that speaks to behind the scenes server-side code and passes data around. So more interesting than this are things like, let's say, um, JetBlue's website. If you go to JetBlue's website and you choose your origin and say, for instance, uh, uh, JFK Airport, if you then choose destination, it will only show you a list of options that you can reach 
from JFK. And this is in contrast to a lot of other websites that might just show you everything. When you click submit, then you're informed you can't do that. I mean, that alone is sort of a compelling quirk to get rid of by use of more dynamism. Now, to be sure, a lot of the stuff you could just do with JavaScript. Right? I could have just shipped those numbers down from the server in the first place. And I could certainly use JavaScript on the client side to generate those numbers as well. So the takeaway here is not so much the functionality we've implemented, but how to implement that kind of dynamism. So I mentioned this inner HTML property earlier. Let me go ahead and do this. I'm going to quickly, below this ugly menu, I'm going to put some line breaks for a moment just to make some space. And then I'm going to put a, another div element, div id equals foo. And it's just going to be, say, here. Okay, I'm going to reload my web page now. And now notice, oh, I'm going to put it, uh, let's center it just so that things are a little cleaner. So align equals center. OK, so now it's in the center of the page. Now what I'm going to do just for kicks is make this thing even uglier and replace here with the list of numbers that have come back. Just to demonstrate how you might insert just data and in mass rather than manipulating it via DOM. Well, we can go ahead and do this. I'm going to go ahead now and go back to my JavaScript code. And after I'm done updating the select menu, I'm also going to do this. Document, which refers to the XHTML document locally, document.getElement by ID of foo. And I'm going to grab its inner HTML property which, as David said, isn't necessarily the way to do this, but it's certainly a common way. And frankly, if you're not so worried about validity and screwing up tags, if you can sort of trust the stuff that you're inserting into the web page, personally, I think it's a wonderful approach to take. And it's sort of a faster way than writing lines of DOM code. So what do I want to put in this? Well, let's go ahead and just put in the request objects, not its response, XH, not its response XML, but rather the response text. Okay, and if I made no errors here, I'm going to reload the page. And notice, even though this is dynamic, the XHTML gets cached. So if you make changes to your JavaScript, perhaps needless to say, you have to refresh the page at least once. So you see your changes. Now, I see that I'm inserting into the web page that list of numbers. Now, it looks like just a space-separated list. But I am literally inserting an XML fragment there. It's just those tags. What's a number tag? It's ignored altogether. And in fact, if I look at the source, this is all being done dynamically. You're not going to actually see the newly inserted content. The browsers don't bother rendering the new, X, the new HTML for you. But what we can do is show you with an alert tag, just for debugging purposes, what this thing looks like, the response text that I inserted. If I go ahead and refresh now. That's, in fact, what I'm inserting into the web page. It's just the browser doesn't know what a numbers or a number tag is, so it ignores it, but it shows the raw data. OK. Questions? So you can do some, no, go ahead. If you remove the form, what? If you remove the form tag, I think it'll work still, too, because it will understand the input element as being a button. Mm -hmm. So, good, good question. So I believe, and I glossed over this earlier, one of, the param one of the arguments I passed in to open was true, which was to say asynchronous. Uh, if you instead say false and make it a synchronous request, I believe what happens is uh, this line, you'll do, let's see. What I believe will happen is you'll click send, and then you'll simply wait in that thread for the response to come back. And then you can proceed by writing additional code in here, much like this code. I'm pretty sure that's how it operates. But it's there as, function, it's, it's there as a feature, even though sort of by name it's meant to be asynchronous. Other questions? OK, so this is perhaps one of the ugliest ways of going about determining if your browser supports some functionality. And I didn't even, there's yet another call that you can use for, say, IE 5.5. Though, frankly, at this point, it's, I think, reasonable to assume that if you're running IE 5.5, we don't need to support you so much anymore. But it's a judgment call. The beautiful thing about AJAX and about JavaScript and about a lot of these sort of new and sexy technologies is that some really industrious people have gone to great lengths to implement some really cool APIs that not only use AJAX, but also really push the limits when it comes to JavaScript. But more importantly, 
do it in a cross-platform way, letting you, the developer, completely abstract away from what browser the user is using and just write logic and not write stupid browser-dependent code. And the, one of the best libraries out there, as David mentioned and I echoed on one of these slides, is Yahoo's library. So if you go to Yahoo's UI library, YUI, well, most of this is geared around JavaScript and doing cool things with, say, calendars, just inserting a calendar into your page with clicks uh, like a like a airline website would have, doing neat things with panels and doing like dialogue windows and stuff and just using these as prepackaged libraries. I won't dwell on those because we're not so much focusing in this class on JavaScript, but I will mention the connection manager class. With this particular library, the connection manager, can you abstract away all of that open and send and event handler stuff that we just implemented sort of from scratch at the lowest level. If you instead use a library like Yahoo's Connection Manager, you don't even talk about an XML HTTP request object. You rather talk about a connection object and leave it to the library to figure out exactly how to instantiate that functionality. So if you do decide to proceed with Ajax, it's fine to tinker, I think, with the low-level stuff we wrote. But if you're trying to write sort of more serious software quickly, I would turn to a library like this to get yourself started. And Yahoo, in particular, has done a really nice job of giving not only standardized documentation, but also the code is free to begin with. The library is open source. They give you examples as well. They have a discussion list. It's really a wonderful resource, not just for uh, Ajax, but for JavaScript stuff in general. So do check that out if you're interested. Other questions? Yeah. All right, why don't we go ahead and, head and take a five-minute pizza break, and we'll return with the last on XML. All right, we're back. It's the beginning of the end here. So this is a huge list of things that begin with the letter X tonight, um, none of which we'll spend much time on, largely because most of these things, at least in my humble opinion, not that interesting or at least not that widely used or widely adopted. But at least it's stuff you might read about. It at least answers questions you might have had that have come up over the course of the term. How do I do this? Well, in some of these, in some of these bullet points might be some of those answers. Uh, so X forms. So this is a recommendation since last year, and it's essentially an XML-based approach to the implementation of HTML forms, which currently are fairly loose and not terribly semantically tagged. And this is a long description of it from the actual recommendation. It's perhaps better explained by way of example. Um, it is ultimately based, again, in XML. It's using XML to represent forms. It uses XML to transmit form submission over the wire and to get back responses. And in principle, it's also meant to be device independent. So it's not necessarily tailored to a particular rendering language. So here might be an example in XHTML of a piece of functionality. And this is taken from the W3 Schools uh, tutorial for X forms. You can pull it up. Um, you can't really use X forms much in browsers. There are third-party plugins that you can use. I think we might have one on the course's website, but frankly, it's not clear how many people have that installed yet. So we'll see what happens with this technology. But in a nutshell, here's an XHTML page. There's a form in here. It's going to map to payment.asp, which is just a Microsoft server um, dynamic uh, server-side code that's going to spit out a response. It's going to post this data, apparently. And in XHTML, we might implement this sort of payment form that asks for a card number and an expiration date and for the person to choose cash or credit card in this kind of XHTML. Right? In and of its, you should certainly be able to code this up, not terribly hard, but it uses the traditional input tags and the form tag and such. So the rendering of it might look like this. Okay. So that's all. This is the state of the art today. So XForms purports to change the model and instead to implement it as such to I don't know why I thought it was appropriate to show you this one line at a time, but OK, here you go. Um, so in X forms, you would have syntax like this. So notice the use of namespaces, first of all, so that the parser, the par processor, the browser, can distinguish the two. Uh, we've got an ID that identifies this whole structure as a payment structure of some sort. We have a submission info that, whose action is the actual uh, server-side code. Method is post. And now here we have these three things, instance, model, and binding. Well, what are those all about? And again, this will be intentionally 
quick just to get the ideas across, not the syntax. So here again, we have more of these XForm prefixed elements. And we have mention of select payment method. But this time, it's tagged as a caption. So the device can sort of decide where and how to render it. We've got a bunch of items that are in choices rather than radio buttons who's, that are associated by e with each other implicitly by way of identical names. We instead have a more clear grouping, sort of like XML schema here. And we've got a value of cash whose caption is going to be cash, capital C, and the same kind of thing for credit. Here we actually have another input that is um, referring back to the form that's mentioned up here. It's referring to something called CC. And CC might be later in the document, so we'll come back to that. Down here, we actually have the caption for expiration date. And down here, we have some mechanism for submission. Which form gets submitted via this button? Well, payment. And then we've got a caption. So again, the takeaway here is just everything is semantically tagged, whereas in XHTML, none of it really is. And the, the relationships among data are largely implicit rather than explicit. The cost, though, of course, is in this verboseness. So the processing field, or rather, when it comes time to process this form, what exactly is submitted to the server? Well, rather than submitting things in a traditional post or get way with an attribute val equals value ampersand, attribute equals value ampersand way, it's instead done as something that's much more human readable, perhaps more straightforwardly processed, processed by existing software off the shelf, certainly more intuitive this way. So you certainly pay a potential performance cost, but not necessarily because, yeah, you have duplication of start tag and end tag, but if your submissions are of reasonable size, it's probably not a problem. So this alone is sort of compelling. Right? That whole mechanism of doing ampersands in between name value pairs is rather kludgy, if nothing else. Compact, maybe, but not terribly elegant or fun to parse. Apparently, that's it on X Farms. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> um, so the short of it, is that that's the spirit of XForms. It's sort of an open question as to what extent this sort of thing is adopted. You're not seeing it adopted by browsers today. There are third-party support for it. Um, but it's an interesting idea that has come out of the W3C. So uh, keep an eye out if of interest. So Xlink, I believe we have seen before back in the day of SVG, one of our simplest uh, SVG examples, I think, was called anchor.svg. And it said, this, well, hi, computer science E259 or something in red. But you could click on that SVG to uh, generate an image to actually pull up the course's website, if you recall that simple example. And that was actually, I think, the lecture we did on videotape. So you might not have noticed. The guy in the video might not have pulled that one up. So um, Xlink, though, is just about standardizing with standard XML notation relationships among documents, relationships among data, essentially a standardized way to include, for simplicity, hyperlinks within XML documents, to do it in a way that you can borrow, again, off-the-shelf software or existing tools that just know what a link is because the way you implement a link is standardized. So think of it this way, perhaps. HTML and XHTML have the anchor tag and the href attribute. Think of Xlink as just a slight, um, slightly more standard way of implementing that same idea, but ripping it out of XHTML itself and putting it in XML, the, the family of XML languages, so that any XML-based language can sort of use the notion of a link, of a hyperlink inside of it. Um, Xlink, uh, OK, so these are some of the overarching goals, which in and of themselves aren't necessarily interesting to those who use it, but rather those who design it. But an example of Xlink might be as follows. Uh, Xlink allows you to express not only simple links, sort of from one resource to another, very much in the HTML model, but more complex links, links that allow you to express relationships in multiple directions, from one document to multiple documents and such. And again, I'm doing this rapidly intentionally just to give you a taste of it. Here's that example. Let's see. Yep, this is that anchor.svg example from lecture six where we had an SVG anchor tag, but we used Xlink's standardization of the href attribute. Why? Well, this is simply because SVG, rather than implement their own href attribute, they just took one off the shelf that exists. It's much like a lot of these XML-based languages borrowing XML schema's data types. Why? Because they exist. And why reinvent the wheel or rewrite software when you can just use other software to achieve the same goal. And that's the spirit of it. The SVG we saw created this uh, text 
block that said this is CSCI E259, and the effect was that if you clicked it, because it was in this anchor tag, you would actually pull up a web page. Why did that happen? Well, it's because Adobe's, in that case, Adobe's SVG viewer is designed to interpret links like these as clickable objects that pull up another web page. But you could interpret it in different ways, certainly. It's just a standardization, really, of the notion of linking. Here's an example whereby if you wanted to associate in this standard way um, a whole bunch of not just links but metadata with, in this case, a Dave Matthews artist. And I think we saw from a while, uh, Okay, I included an XML fragment tonight. I think I ripped that out. I'll put that back online just so you have the file if you want it, but we won't actually um, demo it because it's not terribly illustrative. But this is just to get across the point that not only does Xlink standardize the hyperreference, the idea of a hyperreference, but also things like captions and like the name of the link and the type of role that the link plays. In this case, the link is to an image rather than, say, to another text entity. Arc role suggests, like, what is the role of the relationship between these two things? Well, the descriptor essentially is that this link is a photo for Dave Matthews. Um, actuate simply says when the user clicks on this thing, what should happen? So it's a standardized way of expressing what happens when the link, the href, is act actuated or activated. And that would be uh, processor dependent as to what the behavior is of the processor. And then show what happens when should this thing, when this link is actuated, do you show the resource being pointed to? Do you link to it? Again, these are just the ideas that Xlink tries to get across, but I don't think it's worth, I don't think this is a language like several of these tonight, sort of worth spending much of your time on and just realize that perhaps if they begin to get integrated elsewhere, oh, I remember that, or maybe I kind of remember what the purpose of the thing was in the first place. Here for the curious is sort of a def standard list of definitions for those things, which we pretty much just did verbally. Um, here is the DTD version of that same document, just to give you a sense of it, but again, I think I'll whip we, uh, whip our, uh, whisk our way through these extended links. Okay, so suffice it to say that Xlink does support relationships from one document to many documents. The means by which you express that might be with these, um, in this case, locator elements that borrow Xlink's type and href and title attributes as well. But again, I don't think it's even that, I don't think it's worth our time dwelling on too many of the details. I offer it just as examples. Okay, X pointer kind of a crazy XML-based thing that allows you to express not just uh, general locations in a document like XPath does, but very precise points down to the individual character, say, or down to the individual bit, so to speak. So it was written up in three recommendations, and it essentially um, allows you, think of this as sort of the heavy-handed approach to HTML's fragment IDs. So many of you use, all of you probably used fragment IDs and I think my blockbuster, .xhtml way back when, that allowed you to link to a specific line really in the page. Xpointer is the same spirit, but it lets you hone in on a very specific location in the document, literally between character A and character B, for instance, not necessarily just the broad line of text. So Xpointer just allows you to express relationships in a more complicated but more precise way. Similar in spirit here, we might have um, a fragment ID, a fragment identifier more generally, expressed as follows. If I've got a file called bar.xml on the server foo.org, if I want to really specify a precise point in that document, well, I can do the whole fragment ID thing, but I can be more precise using XPath-like syntax, saying I want an X pointer excuse me, from the article elements section child, but I want the pointer to point just before position number five. So that's the spirit of it. It's sort of fragment IDs to the extreme, if you will. Um, this is a way, this I think I borrowed from the recommendation. Um, and this is just to scare you, really. So I'll put this up, but also not dwell on this. So you can even use numeric syntax to specify terribly precisely not just what elements say you want, but rather what character you want to express. And you do this with this sort of numeric slash dotted notation. Um, convince me that this is valuable in the short term and I'll spend more time on it. But I offer it again just as exposure more than anything else. 
Okay. It's funny how W3C takes years to come out with some recommendations that people are clamoring for, and some of these things, these are done for the past several years, so go figure. Okay, X include. This one, useful, but will underwhelm you. This is simply a standard way of including one XML document in another. And we've seen this before. XSL allows you to do this. XML schema allows you to do this. Well, this is just the W3's way of saying, why do each of these processors, why do each of these languages have to have their own syntax and their own approach to this? Why not at least standardize this? So that if you have an XML parser, for instance, you can simply rely on that parser or some XML processor to do your inclusions and maybe your imports for you. At least your includes in a standardized way. So I think we have, yep, an example here whereby if you, again, we use namespaces to distinguish all these tags from one another, so hopefully by now it's sort of clear that even if it initially namespaces were a little confusing, they're terribly useful. And at the end of the day, they really boil down to just prefixes, colons, and long URL-like looking strings. And that's about it, just like namespaces. Um, if you wanted to include a file called Rowling Bio, so JK Rowling's XML file here, it's going to be parsed as XML. We're going to assume that particular ISO encoding. Well, we would just use the XI include element. And assuming whatever is reading this file supports X include, it would simply do whatever it is meant to do when it comes to including files. In spirit, copying and pasting that file into the current one. Just a standardized way of doing this. So I think you'll see more of this as time goes on, whether it's with XML or just hopefully other such languages in general. Okay, if that was underwhelming, here's one that really underwhelms. So this is a standardized way of expressing the base URL against which relative URLs should be uh, resolved. Okay, so there is an HTML uh, base uh, element that you can say, and uh, Stylus Studio uses this, as you might recall, to actually work around some temporary file issue that allows you essentially to say, resolve all relative links, not relative to the current file's location, but rather to this specified URL. Um, XML base is all about specifying base URLs. And similarly, can you integrate it into other languages? Xlink, for instance, Xinclude, if you want to sort of factor out the base URL to which you're referring, XML base just standardizes that for you. Again, silly, at least, to dwell on, but that useful, at least if it's standardized, if nothing else. So one question that has come up more than once um, on the side in class is issues with encryption. And when you're trying to send data that might involve passwords, credit card information, or just anything you want to keep relatively private, well, the sort of heavy-handed or easy approach to encrypting data when it comes to XML over the wire might be what? if you want to protect communications between client and server. Yeah, so just use it as SSL, right? Just connect to the server by HTTPS colon slash slash, and that pretty much solves the problem, albeit en masse. In terms of performance these days, pretty negligible to let the client do that kind of encryption, so it's not such a big deal. But there is a movement toward um, at least being able to support encryption within XML documents itself so that you can have subsets of the documents encrypted as opposed to the entire documents. Why might this be useful or of interest in some contexts? So if you have a huge XML file, you might not want to encrypt all of it, and that's certainly reasonable. So even using something like SSL might be overkill. And as a matter of fact, I mean, most we many websites, they're saying most websites avoid using SSL for anything other than, say, authentication and password changes. Think of, uh, you know, banks, by contrast, pretty much your whole session is via SSL, and that's sort of by necessity. But if you use something like Facebook or logging in maybe to like Gmail or something like that, they probably use SSL to send your password and username over the wire so that at least that's secure and can't just be sniffed by someone. But after that, your email's already going across the whole internet in the clear. Is it really a problem if we're sending it to your computer in the clear as well? And that just allows them to minimize load on the servers, right? Because if you start talking hundreds and thousands of users, if you can avoid the computational costs and the expense on your server of dealing with SSL, might as well. There's really no need to incur the cost. But when it comes to XML, it'd be nice, perhaps, for some context, if we could ship our data across the wire, especially if, not just for performance reasons, but we want to ensure we can still parse this document 
as XML. And that might be a gotcha. It, you can certainly encrypt the whole document, but you sacrifice your ability to parse the document or navigate it or retrieve subsets thereof unless you decrypt the whole thing. So XML encryption is all about allowing you to encrypt subsets of information in an XML document that maintain the integrity of the hierarchy of the document, but allow you to encrypt, say, just a text node within it, but in a standard way. You could absolutely implement encryption for XML data yourself. Just use any kind of you know, triple des library, AES library, and just encrypt the string that you're putting as the text node somewhere. But, I mean, again, the W3C's job is all about standardization. And again, there is value in a lot of standardization of tools and languages. So here's an example, for instance, of a some kind of payment transaction between client and server that in the clear might look like this. But if we actually encrypt this, notice it might look more like this, where the number is no longer just the number 4019, but rather it's an encrypted data element. It's using the XML encryption namespace, but only on this node. So notice that even though there's no prefix here, it's assumed because I'm temporarily changing the default namespace. So remember that trick. The type is, again, just what kind of encryption are we using. The cipher data's value is now this hexadecimal value, which presumably decompresses to that string there. And then finally, we close the tag, close the number, and then the rest of the stuff, eh, maybe in, in uh, expiration probably should have been encrypted too. And I mean, when we start talking about this, it's reasonable to encrypt all of a financial transaction. But this is taken, I think, from a uh, IBM Developer Works tutorial, which you haven't caught on to these yet. We link to a number of them on the course's website. They, too, are wonderful resources, like the W3 schools. Um, this would be how you might standardize the encryption of just a portion of your data. And assuming your XML processor knows about XML encryption, you can sort of rely on it doing the decryption for you. So what your application is ultimately handed is, say, the, the unencrypted data, and you don't have to jump through those hoops, right? The whole, the, the sort of spirit we began with tonight about JXPath and JDOM wasn't about doing new things, but just doing existing things better or more easily. So that's in the same spirit. XML key management, if you're familiar with public key infrastructure, PKI, um, and encryption and cryptography in general, sort of inherently related to the notion of encryption these days, especially when clients and servers don't necessarily know each other in advance, you need to exchange keys in some manner or verify keys in some manner. So the W3C has also taken steps towards standardizing how you might manage keys. This is from their recommendation and shows you how you might uh, deliver, in this case, an X509 certificate, essentially public keys, private keys, that kind of stuff is standardized here. An XML signature, if again you're familiar with crypto and PKI, is all about um, implementing digital signatures in XML. So that was, as, some, as uh, one of your classmates said on the listserv today, everything but the kitchen sink when it comes to XML. Any questions on the exposure you just got? All right, so let's tie up just a couple of loose ends here. So this is just a word or so on data modeling, if you will. So again, we're leaving behind all new XML-related languages and just concluding on these notes. So one question that we posed early in the class was, do you represent something as an attribute? Do you represent something as an element? Well, this boils down to questions of how do you model your data? How do you represent it? And once you exit a course like this, you know, no longer are you necessarily being handed DTDs and schemas and XML documents that you need to deal with, rather you might need to be doing the generation. So at least giving a, a moment's thought um, after this course to how you might want to go about modeling your data is perhaps worthwhile, especially when if you dive into things like Ajax. I mean, I happen to use, let's see, I happen to use XML as the transport mechanism for this particular data, didn't need to, but here's just a very trivial example of where I needed to make a judgment call as to how to model my data that I was returning to the browser. An upside of this is that it's terribly straightforward and it's a pretty small data set, overall pretty reasonable. Downside is there is more metadata in here than there is actual data, so maybe I made a foolish decision in this case and perhaps there's a better way. So the only point here tonight is that it's worth giving at least some thought as to how you represent your data lest you paint yourself into a corner and subsequently make more work for yourself. There was that converter.xsl question in Xtube, which was all about getting you to think about how could we have implemented, represented this data better 
so that it might have taken more time up front to sort of piece the data together, to clean it up, to massage it into a useful format. But afterward, it might have made your XPath queries so much easier or your XSL run so much faster. And so that's the motivation for actually giving some of this a bit of thought. Um, for instance, just to, here's a, a silly sort of example. If you're inclined, as in the world of relational databases, to have fields like address one, address two, address three, just realize, if you haven't already, that's not really what XML is all about. Better would be to abstract away in sort of this way. There is the notion of document order, and you can trust that the first element implicit in it is a sort of positioning, and you can use that as a sort of hint to yourself as to what fields might mean what. So again, here too, just a reminder that you don't necessarily want to just reinvent the relational uh, wheel, so to speak, in an XML format, but actually sort of try to make use of what features the language allows you. Um, this here is a reminder, let's see. Okay, so this is just sort of a, a couple of words on actually considering whether you're going to make something an element or an attribute. A curious thing there, especially if you do go down this road of Ajax and start doing things like DOM-like code, turns out that putting things in attributes, it makes it so much easier in JavaScript to get at the data. Because just notice, how did we get the actual text child's value in this example? Yeah, I mean, that's not exactly fun code to write. I mean, even I had to look that up for the syntax to remind myself what, what I needed to type to get at the right value. Once you know it, fine, not a big deal. And you can use variables and use shortcuts to simplify things. But you can also just call something like get attribute and pass in the name that you want to get. If you don't need the hierarchy of elements, it might be worth representing things, say, as attributes. You throw away the notion of order, but that might be fine as well. So besides issues of extensibility, there comes time to process, when it comes time to process XML data, you know, the language issues might itself motivate the layout of your XML content. So this, uh, you don't have this in your printouts because it was just whipped up, but this was just a mention of a course. This course will also be offered again next year in the fall, um, Computer Science E259, XML with Java and such. Uh, it may be retitled XML with Java, JSP, and Java Servlet, just so that we emphasize a bit more of the server-side stuff next year, but don't retake it unless you do poorly this year. Um, a new course, which has yet to be titled, which is something I will also likely do in the fall, if this is of interest to you, is similarly server-side, but essentially will be a soup-to-nuts course whereby you learn in this course how to, one, buy a domain name. We'll spend a couple minutes only on that. It'll assume knowledge of, say, HTML and such. But we'll proceed quite rapidly then to likely give students full control over a virtual machine of their own on which they'll have root, with which they'll then be able to configure uh, things like Apache's web server, configure things like a MySQL installation, a PHP installation. And the course will ultimately be about building dynamic websites using the LAMP framework and Ajax itself. And LAMP is just a buzzword these days for the combination of Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. And Ajax, of course, is something that we touched upon tonight. So if you or anyone you know might be interested in that sort of thing, take a glance at the catalog come late summer if something like that might be of interest to you. So where did we begin? So these were two quotes, recall, from students from yesteryear that, silly or tongue-in-cheek as they were, actually, I think, are pretty um, expressive of what XML is all about or what this course, perhaps, is all about. XML is beautiful. <laughs> that itself might be an overstatement. But as with beautiful people, it is neither easy to get along with nor quick. Now, I'm still amazed that a student came up with that in 60 seconds on paper in the middle of class, but it happened. XML's strength, and this is perhaps a good motto to adopt for XML, is its wide adoption and excellent tools. XML itself is not that exciting. And hopefully, you know, even though this course is entitled XML with dot, 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 hopefully what you've gained from the course is exposure not only to languages, but just tools that help you get jobs done. So the goals of this course, recall, were to ideally cut through the hype, even though I have a tend to give, uh, tendency to give elevator pitches when it comes to some of these stuffs, but at least get down to 
the core of what's actually useful about these things and to make the course particularly hands-on. Focus on what's practicality and what's possible and actual development of applications rather than dwelling too long on silly XPath queries and exercises in just syntax, which in and of themselves not terribly interesting. And to emphasize ultimately, as we did with project one, an understanding hopefully from the bottom up. So you know not only how to parse an XML document, but you at least hopefully have more of an intellectual understanding of what's involved in that, what the performance implications are, how you, you yourself might need to make judgment calls when it comes time to design your own software related to it. And ultimately, this whole laundry list of um, technologies and languages and tools that we've looked at in the course. These all being languages, these here being APIs, these here being technologies and protocols and standards, and then also some fairly industry standard tools. So that's it for Computer Science E259. I do look forward to seeing your final projects. I will follow up with you on those via email and such, but you still have a couple of weeks' time for them. Otherwise, I'll stick around tonight if you have any questions. And please feel free to take a pizza or two home with you. Huh? Farewell. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Wait. Okay. We're back and <laughs> It would not be computer science E259 if you did not get the proverbial brownie points. So you're know, still going to get about a bag of brownies each. So we also have uh, some brownies as well that you can take home with you. So I will leave these at the door. And those of you tuning in from home, my apologies. It's much more fun to be here in person. So, All right.